I'd like to uh, begin this press conference. Uh, my name is Ian Thomas Ash, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and a member here at the club. And it's my honor to uh, introduce to you today's guest. Uh, Dr. Timothy Musso is a professor of biological sciences at the University of South Carolina. And in addition to his work examining birds and other wildlife living around the damage to clip hara plants at Chernobyl and Fukushima, uh, he has also recently served on the National Academy of Science Committee to examine the incidence of cancer near nuclear power plants. Uh, I first had the honor of meeting uh, Professor Musso in March of this year in Germany uh, at a congress called The Effects of Nuclear Disasters on the Natural Environment and Human Beings that is, uh, was organized by the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And yesterday I also had the honor of attending uh, Professor Musso's presentation uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and other hot places, uh, biological consequences of nuclear accidents for avifauna at the 26th International Ornithological Congress at St. Paul's University here in Tokyo. Uh, I'm not going to take any more time uh, to introduce our guest, and I would like to turn over the floor to him. Please. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Uh, it really is a, ladies and gentlemen, it really is a pleasure to be here. I'd uh, like to thank you all for taking some time out this Friday afternoon. Uh, I'd also especially like to recognize Ambassador Murata for coming out this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, and I should also uh, acknowledge uh, uh, a few other folks, but I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, and I'd, of course, like to thank the uh, uh, Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan for hosting this event. Uh, it really is a great privilege to spend a few minutes this afternoon with you to discuss uh, some of the recent scientific findings uh, related to the uh, Fukushima radiological disaster. And, uh, you know, to be honest, as a, as a simple scientist, it's not very often that uh, we come and give a, a formal press conference uh, related to, uh, you know, these kinds of findings. And so, uh, but, but there's been some developments in the last year or two, really, uh, especially in recent months, that, uh, that really, I think, bring uh, some sense of urgency to sharing some of these latest findings. And uh, so today, hopefully, I'll have a chance to uh, share a few key results from our, our, our recent work, not just our work, but mostly our work. Uh, and, um, and hopefully, this will uh, be of some relevance, I think, to uh, certainly the people of Japan, as well as people that might be visiting Japan in the coming years. Uh, so my, my, my concerns of the past few months really have stemmed from the fact that there's a, no, a growing number of scientific studies uh, that uh, concerning radiation effects on plants and animals from Chernobyl, but also from Fukushima, and that uh, these have clearly demonstrated uh, impacts, injuries to individuals, populations, communities, and even whole ecosystems. These findings, I think, are of Significant, have significant implications for the recovery of contaminated regions of Japan. And I, I'll discuss some of these recent findings in a few minutes in uh, some detail. A second reason for uh, my concern stems from the fact that it's apparent that some government, uh, governmental and intergovernmental organizations are uh, ignoring uh, the scientific studies and uh, I, you can't help but think that this must be a deliberate attempt to, to minimize some of these consequences for the environment related to nuclear accidents. Um, you know, I think, let me just go into uh, a couple of the recent uh, reports. Uh, when we first got going into the work in Chernobyl, uh, this report was released by the International Atomic Energy Agency's Chernobyl Forum, and uh, this kind of motivated a lot of our recent work. They suggested that populations of many plants and animals have expanded and that the present environmental conditions have had a positive impact on the biota of the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Uh, we had been to Chernobyl a few times prior to this report and could see no evidence that this was the case, and so this really motivated much of our recent work uh, as a test of this. Uh, more recently, and a more relevance for, for today's presentation, is the recent UNSCAR uh, report to the UN General Assembly, uh, where they suggested with a complete absence of any sort of supporting documentation that exposures of both marine and terrestrial non-human biota following the Fukushima accident were, in general, too low 
for acute effects to be observed. And then they, they kind of contradict themselves in the second part of this statement, suggesting that any radiation effects would be restricted to a limited area where the deposition of radioactive material was greatest. Beyond that area, the potential for effects on biota is insignificant. And, and this, this particularly uh, troubled us, given that there had been uh, perhaps a half a dozen publications related to Fukushima that had been released prior to the release of this report, and, and many more related to Chernobyl effects, which are quite similar in, in, in terms of the radiation and consequences. So uh, again, this is the primary motivation for um, speaking out today. Um, you know, I guess it's really I'll pro probably important to mention that uh, the unmentionable, <laughs> or what, what is often unmentioned, uh, is that, you know, it's been suggested uh, informally, perhaps, that, it, that a defensible reason for making such statements, uh, even in the absence of rigorous scientific data, is to minimize panic and hence human stress, which is, of course, a very significant cause of disease in humans. And it is certainly conceivable that the human health consequences of such stresses could be larger than the direct health consequences of exposure to radionuclides in the environment. But to be sure, no one will ever know the answer to that uh, particular question if, uh, you know, if we don't actually do the research uh, related to uh, the, the radiation exposure per se. And certainly any attempts to minimize the human health effects because of the, a desire to minimize stress will certainly lead to violations of the near universal governmental and intergovernmental mandates to also protect the environment. Uh, you know, it, it's not just the people we need to protect, but also the broader environmental uh, situation. And of course, the, uh, the mission of one, another related UN organization, the United Nations Environmental Program, is specifically to protect the environment for future generations. So uh, with that as a sort of a preamble, uh, I'd like to uh, just present uh, very, very quickly, uh, so that we have lots of times of questions, some of the, the key results that have been generated in the last few years. And at the very end, I'll present uh, some results that we presented yesterday at the International Ornithological Congress here in Tokyo uh, concerning our latest findings following four years of surveys uh, of birds and insects in the Fukushima area. Um, first, I just want to start by saying that there have been now, since the Chernobyl Forum report, many, many studies relating radiation exposure of the sort seen in Chernobyl and Fukushima to genetic damage. Uh, the first sort of summary of these kinds of effects was presented in a review paper that my colleague and I uh, published in 2006 in direct response to the Chernobyl Forum report using literature from Eastern Europe as well as the Western scientific literature. Uh, this is a list of the, 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 the studies that had been known prior to the Chernobyl Forum report, uh, most of which show very clear genetic consequences of exposure to the low-dose radiation seen in Chernobyl. Uh, we have since uh, conducted uh, a meta-analysis. This was just published last year uh, in the Biological Reviews of the Cambridge Philosophical Society. Uh, you know, the, the nuclear industry will often suggest that the levels of radiation found in Chernobyl and Fukushima are in many parts of these areas, lower than the natural radioactive areas of the world, where it suggested there are no consequences of the radiation. We tested this directly by surveying the literature for hundreds of uh, scientific papers and did a, a very rigorous statistical analysis, a meta-analysis of these findings. And what we found, again published in this, this paper, uh, was that there were small but significant consequences to humans and the plants and animals living in these naturally radioactive areas, which uh, by definition are low dose as well. So even in these other areas, there are consequences. You've all probably heard of the studies done uh, by, a, by a group of Japanese scientists in Okinawa concerning the pale blue grass butterfly. Wonderful study uh, demonstrating, again, some significant consequences. Uh, again, this is a first study. Uh, it needs to be replicated, it needs to be added to, but it's certainly uh, uh, an important uh, point of reference that should have been made uh, in the uh, UNSCAR report. So genetic damage is pretty much universally seen even under conditions of low dose uh, radiation. What does it mean to the organisms living in these environments? 
Well, um, uh, you know, we just published a paper a few months ago showing, for instance, that in Chernobyl, when we look at the birds, when we look at the sperm, the gametes, the next generation of birds, as it were, uh, in nine out of ten species of these birds, the Chernobyl population showed dramatically increased genetic or damage, morphological damage to the sperm. Uh, and this, of course, has consequences to the fertility of these organisms. Um, we just published a paper a few months ago in, in the journal PLOS ONE uh, looking at, again, uh, the male fertility. What we found was, in, again, in the areas of higher contamination, up to 40% of the males were completely sterile. They had no sperm or just a few dead sperm in these samples. Again, uh, very high rates. Uh, this is not particularly surprising given what we know from the medical literature, uh, but it's the first time it had been observed. Can you imagine that? Chernobyl happened how long ago? 28 years ago? And nobody had ever looked for these kinds of effects before? Uh, in any case, the, uh, the findings are overwhelming. Uh, a nice dose-response relationship. In the, the clean areas, the males are all perfectly fine. Um, you've all probably, <laughs> any of you interested in this topic, have heard about the, the white feathers on birds that have been reported for Chernobyl, the partial albinos. Uh, this was the first thing observed. It's very easy to see. You can use a pair of binoculars and observe it. Uh, we published a paper last year, again, showing that all sorts of different birds in Chernobyl show this effect. Uh, and it shows a dose-response relationship with many higher, much higher frequencies in the, in the more radioactive areas. Uh, Two years ago in Fukushima, we found our first swallow with patches of white feathers. Uh, again, rarely seen outside of Chernobyl, radioactive areas of Chernobyl. Uh, we've since been documenting, uh, in collaboration with the Wild Bird Society of Japan, many more additional cases of these partial albinos. Again, it's probably not a, partic it's not a particularly uh, damaging kind of mutation, uh, but it is a, a biomarker for the effects of radiation. Uh, you've all probably heard of the Fukushima cows with the white spots. On, I, I apologize for showing you the rear end of a, of a cow here, uh, but this is just one of many, many cows uh, in the area that are showing this phenotype. It, it's, you know, we don't know if these white spots are the, a direct consequence of the radiation exposure because nobody is studying this question. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, but it is, uh, it, it is a, probably not a coincidence that they're only found in the Fukushima zone. Uh, there are no cows in Chernobyl at the moment, so we don't know. Many of the other signs uh, of, of radiation exposure, though, are less benign. So, for instance, last year we published a paper showing that in the, the more contaminated regions of, of Chernobyl, many of the birds have tumors and other strange growth abnormalities that are not seen in any kind of frequency in other places. Uh, we haven't uh, been able to check for this in uh, Fukushima birds yet. We hope that we'll be given a chance to do this in, as time goes on. Uh, another paper recently published uh, relates to the fact that uh, individuals living in, uh, humans living in more radioactive situations often experience higher frequencies of cataracts. Uh, we discovered uh, last published in the last two years ago uh, that the uh, birds of Chernobyl also show higher frequencies of cataracts in the eyes. The frequencies of cataracts are much more, uh, much more likely to see a cataract in a bird in the more radioactive areas. Um, Again, the, uh, we, we, a couple years ago, we published a paper showing that the birds of Chernobyl have smaller brains. And, and of course, I, 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 I've since asked myself whether maybe my brain's getting a little smaller from all the time we're spending in these areas. Uh, some days I feel that's probably the case. And, uh, but uh, the, um, this, this was a very uh, striking result and, and an important result uh, simply because um, there's also some consequence to this effect of radiation on neurological development, which has also been observed, reported for children living in the Chernobyl affected regions. Uh, it has cognitive, it likely has cognitive effects. Birds with smaller brains are much less likely to survive to the following year. Uh, and so, and this is what this graph shows and published in PLOS ONE again two years ago. Um, this, this picture right here is, is simply, uh, it's a photo of a, a common bug, uh, the, the fire bug. Uh, I like to call it the face mask bug because uh, the, uh, oops, my, 
thing's not working. Anyway, if you, can, if you look at it carefully, and I'll just mask out the legs and the antenna. Can you all see the face mask there with the eyes? Well, uh, I, I use this as an example of how it is that every rock we turn over, sometimes literally, we see evidence of the effects of radiation. Uh, these, these bugs were we, were, we first noticed in Chernobyl when we turned over a rock and noticed that many of the bugs uh, showed uh, um, very strange abnormalities, very obvious because of this you know, face mask kind of motif, uh, making it really easy to spot. Uh, but again, the frequency of these abnormalities directly proportional to the background radiation level. Uh, but it's not just the birds and the bees and the bugs, it's the trees, again, uh, show very strange growth abnormalities. These are, these are Scots pines uh, that uh, are, uh, uh, were affected by the radiation and affecting their growth form. They're normally tall and straight. Now they look really kind of bizarre. Uh, but you also see effects on the growth uh, of these trees. The growth is depressed. Uh, the quality of the wood of these trees is also affected as a result. Uh, we recently published this paper in the journal Trees, appropriately enough, uh, showing again that in areas of radi high radiation or you know, significant radiation, uh, tree growth is dramatically depressed. So there could be uh, significant economic consequences of, uh, of the radiation in these areas where timber is, lo is, is logged a lot. We, again, we just published a paper uh, a few months ago showing, uh, describing how it is that in Chernobyl, and we, we see evidence of this in Fukushima now as well, uh, it, when we first started walking through the old uh, forests of, of Chernobyl where the dead trees were still lying 20 years later, pretty much intact, uh, hadn't decomposed, it you know, sort of dawned on us maybe the bacterial and fungal community, the microbial community was influenced by radiation and sl the slowed down microbial decomposition. And, and so we actually did an experiment where we put out uh, dead leaf material, uh, 600 bags of these dead leaves uh, across the zone at various levels of radiation. And the findings were pretty, pretty conclusive. Uh, the rate of decomposition of this dead plant material was dramatically reduced in the areas of, of significant contamination. And, and this could in part, of course, explain why the tree growth is also uh, reduced in these areas because the nutrient cycling that normally goes on in the ecosystem is, is obviously uh, impeded uh, in these areas. So strong ecosystem level effects as well. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, the last set of, uh, of, of results that I wanted to present concerns, again, this, this more general question of, are Animal, is animal abundance and biodiversity affected? Uh, the Chernobyl Forum report suggested it wasn't, uh, and so, and as well as the NSCAR report. And so what we've done is to actually go out and test this idea. Uh, we've published quite a number of papers in the last few years, uh, especially related to the Chernobyl effects. Uh, they're all available on my website for anyone who wants to see them, uh, the, um, or most of them are. And we've published a couple of papers now on, on Fukushima related. The basic approach is, is very simple. Any biologist can do this. And, um, but as far as I know, we're the only ones who've done it in any, with any significant, in any significant number. And the basic idea is you go to uh, very contaminated and very clean areas within the same general area. Both Chernobyl and Fukushima are highly heterogeneous with respect to the radiation levels. You can find a hot spot here and uh, you know, a kilometer away, it'll be 10 times or even 100 times less contaminated. And so this gives a lot of, uh, uh, gives a, the, the ability to do strong statistical comparisons in many different parts of these zones. Uh, so replicated scientific comparisons of, of these hot and cold areas that are very similar with respect to the other environmental parameters except for radiation. So it's a very strong approach. Again, I don't think anybody's uh, been doing this other than us. Uh, here in, in Japan, we've been doing this in the Fukushima area. These little squiggles show the general areas that we've worked, again, in hot and cold areas. 400 discrete locations, uh, 1,500 of these biotic inventories in total. Uh, we call this a massively replicated biotic inventory design. And, and, and again, this, this, I think lots of people do bird counts, but I don't think anybody's put them together in quite this way. 
We have our, our bird counts or our insect counts or our spider counts. We measure all of the other environmental variables of potential significance concerning the abundance and distribution of an organism. We also do, of course, measurements of the radiation at the, the level. We use geographic information systems kinds of approaches and some fancy multivariate statistics. And this allows us to predict what the radiation effects are on these populations. And in effect, it gets around the problem that of the fact that we don't actually know, of course, exactly what was in these places before the accidents. Nobody was there studying the animals there. This allows us to use the broader landscape scale patterns that we see now to predict what should be there. And from that, look at the deviations from what should be there. And this gives us our measures of what the radiation effects are on various groups. Uh, very powerful approach, uh, seems to be working. It gives us a lot of insight. These are the results from Chernobyl, uh, the first results from Chernobyl. When we look at the high radiation areas, numbers of birds, for instance, are depressed by two-thirds in the more radioactive areas. A particular note is that there's really no indication of any kind of threshold effect. It just continues down to the lower levels. When we look at uh, the total biodiversity, the numbers of species, we see the same basic pattern with uh, depressed numbers. We've looked at many different groups of organisms and we find the same basic patterns for dragonflies, butterflies, spiders, and et cetera. Um, here are the results from Fukushima. And these are, these are quite interesting. Uh, and I, I guess, let's see if I can't get this pointer to work. Um, <laughs> All right, so here we have uh, this, this side of the graph is from 2011, July 2011, a few months after the, after the disaster. What you can tell from this graph is that some of the species over here were negatively impacted even July 2011. But quite a few species, each one of these points is a species of bird, quite a few of these species were not affected that first year. And in, there's even one over here that was positively impacted for whatever reason. But by 2012, oops, wrong way. By 2012, looking on this axis, many more species were negatively affected. And in fact, the strength of the negative effect on these species has actually increased for most of these. Even the one that was positive in, in 2011, it was much, much closer to not being affected and was heading downward. These next figures are really, really important. And, and this really was the motivation for speaking today. These are the results from four years of data. So starting July 2011, uh, and, and we just did the last count last month uh, here in Fukushima. And what this, this graph shows very, very strikingly is that the total numbers of birds drops off with radiation in Fukushima in a very consistent pattern. Uh, there, again, there's no evidence of any kind of threshold uh, of radiation level below which there's no effect. Uh, and, and again, very consistent from over the years with, with the effect increasing through time, as I just mentioned. So that's the total numbers of birds. The effects on species richness or biodiversity are even more striking. Again, uh, dropping off with increasing radiation. Uh, again, these are each, each one of these is a, is a point uh, of one of the 400 points that we've looked at four times uh, over the last few years. Uh, so very, very striking uh, patterns of results. Uh, these, these, uh, these are, um, again, we, these were presented yesterday at the International Ornithological Congress. Uh, and this is just a more detailed uh, analysis of, of the species effects, uh, the distribution of species effects, and you're probably <laughs> not too interested in this. So what does this all mean? I seem to be on time. Uh, I would suggest that what it means is that contrary to governmental reports, there is now an abundance of information demonstrating consequences in other words, injury to individuals, population, species, and ecosystem functions stemming from the low-dose radiation uh, due to Chernobyl and Fukushima disasters. What should be done about it? Uh, and again, I'm speaking <laughs> from my personal perspective, really. I, 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 you know, I, I didn't start, I usually start off these kinds of presentations with the disclaimer. Uh, I'm not an anti-nuclear activist. I want to make that clear. Uh, uh, at all. What I am is an activist for evidence-based policy related to the environment. And uh, I found that it's necessary to, to step up in this way uh, because the message wasn't getting out uh, otherwise. But what we're calling for is uh, uh, funding 
of some international scientific effort to fully document the range of biological consequences related to low-dose radiation in the environment. And a, a key point here, I think, uh, again, uh, especially as it relates to some of these other reports that were generated presumably with some scientific input, uh, th this effort must be led by independent scientists who are committed to a rigorous, unbiased analysis of the present situation with the goal of predicting long-term impacts. Uh, this really obviously hasn't been done at this to this point. And the question that always follows, of course, is how are we going to pay for this? And, uh, you know, I <laughs> get that all the time. And, I, 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 you know, that's not my job. But what I would like to just briefly mention is the fact that, uh, as you probably most of you already know, uh, it's predicted that the cost of decommissioning the, the, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant will be at least $15 billion, multiply that by 100 uh, for yen. And we all know that's a, a way lowball estimate of what the total cost is going to be. If we, from Based on what we know about the Hanford site in the United States, of course, which will cost more than $100 billion to clean up, it seems likely that there will be uh, added costs. The, the predicted costs of cleanup and compensation in the contaminated, contaminated ages, areas of Fukushima we know will exceed $80 billion. If we allocated 0.1% towards environmental research related to this disaster, that would come to $90 billion, which would be plenty of funds to get things going. Uh, I'd frankly be happy with 0.01%, but that's just me. Uh, so um, I think with that, I just wanted to uh, thank you again for, for coming out this afternoon. Uh, if you're interested in any of these publications, photos, or some of the other press covers that we've had, uh, please visit our website, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, I would like to now open up the floor um, for questions. We'll take questions from working press first. Please, no uh, speeches. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Richard Lloyd Parry of The Times. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, to go back to the slides at the very beginning when you were, where you were quoting the uh, statements by Unskier, um, can you perhaps re restate and spell out what, what this represents? Is it fair to say that the this UN body is downplaying um, the, 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 the dangers, the damage to the environment? Can, can we call it a cover-up? How would you, how would you characterize that? Uh, and second, shall I? Go ahead. The, the second question was about the research in Chernobyl and the research in Fukushima. Uh, most of the studies you were pointing to seem to be from Chernobyl, because obviously that was longer ago. Um, am I right in uh, saying that the, in terms of published studies or studies that have been made public, uh, in, from Fukushima we're looking at the butterfly, uh, the grass butterfly, and the um, uh, the the figures for birds which you uh, presented at the congress yesterday. Are, are there others? Uh, we, we, uh, I'll start with the second question. Uh, we 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 actually have published uh, two papers. Uh, on the birds and the insects uh, related to Fukushima in the last two years uh, that were not mentioned in the UNSCAR report. Uh, there actually was a paper on aphids published recently uh, by some Japanese scientists. Another paper came out recently uh, concerning uh, the effects on macaques. Uh, and there, 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 there have been other studies. Not, not a whole lot. Uh, you're right. So most of the work related to this topic, of course, comes from studies in Chernobyl. Uh, not just because it happened longer ago, but, but because it's been a lot easier to do research in Chernobyl. Uh, you know, the, uh, that, that certainly is one element. It does take some time to publish scientific reports, um, often a year or two at least. Uh, so, but there's, you know, again, part of what, part of the point today is that as far as we can tell so far, there does not seem to be uh, any, uh, any dramatic difference between the effects of radiation in Chernobyl versus the effects of radiation in Fukushima. Uh, and, and I think that is uh, one of the take-home messages that the lessons learned from Chernobyl seem to, we certainly, the prudent 
course would be to uh, take these uh, in consideration when considering uh, potential long-term impacts for the Fukushima region. Uh, getting back to your first question related to the UNSCAR report, um, I, all I'm saying, all I'm trying to say is that uh, they have very clearly uh, not considered the broader literature related to this topic. This particular committee is not concerned specifically with Fukushima, although that report, of course, was directed towards the consequences of Fukushima. But this committee is concerned with the effects of radiation in the environment, more broadly speaking. And they have clearly uh, ignored and I can only consider it to be uh, deliberate ignorance uh, because of the, uh, the fact that for the last uh, really three, three years, uh, we have made uh, every possible effort to communicate the findings of our research and others as broadly as we possibly can. And uh, we've, been, we've had some, some success in that regard. So there's no excuse for not uh, knowing about this literature. Uh, and, and, and given that their task is to protect uh, the international community, not just Japan, they should be uh, um, held accountable uh, to the very highest standards of, of objectivity. Martin Fackler with the New York Times. Um, you just made a very, what I think is a remarkable statement, which is you were saying it was more difficult to do research in Fukushima mm. than in Chernobyl. Mm. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that. And I wonder, do you think, is there too little research being done in Japan on Fukushima? And are Japanese scientists not paying attention? I wonder if there are structural issues, government funding issues. I just wonder if you could explore that idea a bit more. Thank you. Uh, certainly. Thank you very much. Um, so, and, and these are all related questions, of course. And the, um, so the, the simple answer is that um, in, in Chernobyl, uh, as, as difficult as it is to work there, uh, there are mechanisms in place to promote uh, so a collaboration with the international community to provide some level of support for uh, scientific investigations uh, in that region of all sort, all sorts. And uh, there's a centralized uh, governing uh, organization that, uh, that provides for permissions and permits and even accommodations uh, for scientists wanting to conduct research in that area. In Japan and Fukushima, uh, because of the, uh, the instability, I, I suppose, uh, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but because of the complexities I, is probably a better way to put it, uh, there is no one uh, entry for research. In fact, there's no entry at all uh, for formal research activities in the zone. Each municipality in the area, uh, Futaba, Namiya, Itate, uh, they all have their own responsibilities uh, and, and maintain control of access to the zone uh, individually. And, and so we, uh, so for, for instance, the first year that we visited, uh, it was just be simply because there was no, <laughs> there was no control at all of the area, really, uh, except for the most contaminated areas that we managed to gain access. The second year, uh, we, uh, uh, we had some help with partial access to, to the more contaminated areas. The third year, we, we actually uh, uh, found collaborators uh, with the Japanese press, primarily, who have helped us considerably uh, to get through some of these, uh, these barriers. So one reason that there isn't a whole lot of research being done in the area is that it's extremely difficult. Uh, to uh, to gain entry, uh, it, it, the other reason is that there is almost no funding available directly for this kind of research uh, for Japanese scientists or international scientists. One reason for this is that because of the complexities that I've just outlined, uh, I can't promise a granting agency that I'm going to be able to do anything uh, in this 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 uh, this area. Uh, we we come and we uh, opportunistically take advantage of the opportunities that arise. Uh, we hope uh, that things will work out. Uh, you know, we've been doing this particular study for for four years. We have another study on the coast looking at barn swallows that we've been doing for three years now. Uh, and uh, we've just started a study on the rodents in the area as well. Uh, that I, I should have mentioned, but I didn't have time to, to mention uh, earlier. 
the, so so the, the, the two constraints are the complexities of, of gaining access and doing research and the lack of funding directly related to this research. In Chernobyl, uh, there's the access issues have been worked out and the uh, funding is much more readily available, although still not particularly uh, abundant sources of funds for Chernobyl. Uh, there are many Japanese scientists uh, who are interested in doing research in the Chernobyl or the Fukushima question. Uh, they have not. They've also had the same barriers uh, to overcome, and perhaps it's been a little more difficult for them because of uh, the cultural differences or cultural issues. They they know <laughs> when they're not allowed, and we don't. And so sometimes we can get through these issues. Uh, uh, we can find the path of least, least resistance that might not be available to Japanese scientists, but there's also no funding available for them. So what efforts have been uh, made are very limited in scope uh, and, uh, and, and certainly will not serve to uh, address the, the larger issues that we need to get at in a rigorous way. Uh, you know, th this kind of, this question is, is serious. It's an, it's an important issue and we need to do serious, rigorous science. Uh, and, you know, half-baked scientific studies are going to do more harm than good. Uh, and and that, that really is part of the issue. It's hard to say this without uh, potentially insulting somebody, but it is um, important that the resources be made available and access be made available so that rigorous science can be conducted. So, uh, does that Elaine Kurtenbach, Associated Press, nice to meet you. Um, a couple of questions. One is about to what effect this um, international body can have an impact on Japanese policymaking, potentially. Um, and the other question is just about cause and effect. You mentioned about the trees not deteriorating in Chernobyl area. Okay, so I'm assuming that this has ecosystem-wide impacts and implications. And looking at Fukushima, where they're trying to clean up and gather a lot of biological matter that's radiated, contaminated. I mean, it seems to me that there are implications both for how you handle that cleanup and also for the species. I mean, is, are you extrapolating from what you're seeing to, to think that perhaps part of the reason why the numbers of animals is decreasing is because the entire ecosystem is affected by the radiation, from the lichens on up, the bacteria on up? <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah. Um, I'll start with the Japanese policy question. I, I, think, uh, I think that most governmental agencies, funding agencies, uh, do respond to these kinds of general policy uh, or these kinds of policy-related policy statements. And so, of course, they set the stage. Uh, you know, I think I bring up the example on occasion that 15, 15 years ago, uh, we knew nothing or very little about climate change. And there were very few people studying climate change. There was almost no money to do research in climate change. Uh, but, you know, there was a uh, growing awareness in the scientific community that this was important. And uh, through <laughs> and, and following uh, shifts in, in some of these kinds of agencies, uh, the IPCC in particular, uh, there have been dramatic changes in, in, in access and funding uh, and, and the amount of research being done on that particular topic. Uh, so, yes, I think, I think these kinds of uh, governmental pronouncements are incredibly important in steadying the stage, providing leadership. Uh, that provides an excuse for funding the initiatives. Um, uh, you know, the National Science Foundation in the U.S. now uh, provides billions of dollars for climate change research. Uh, it's, it's one of their top priorities. Getting to the, uh, the global, the, the issue of global ecosystem effects, yes, I, I think that what, you know, the only conclusion you can come to uh, from the, the increasing body of evidence from Chernobyl is that there, that all components of this ecosystem seem to be affected from the bacteria in the soil, the fungi, fungi in the soil, uh, all the way up to the, the top predators, uh, the raptors, birds of prey. Um, and the, um, they are all connected, of course. Uh, but, you know, as we pick away at, at the various components of the ecosystem, we, we, we have not found any particular components that, are, that don't seem to be affected in some way. And so, uh, again, we know too little. Uh, you know, there's, there's 
too few of us doing this kind of work. There are many other aspects of the ecosystem that we haven't got at. We'd love to be able to do more fundamental genetics uh, in these, these systems. Uh, again, that's expensive research and that has not really been addressed to this point for, for any of these systems, uh, as just as an example. Süddeutsche Zeitung, Neidhardt. Uh, first, uh, the government, the Japanese government, obviously, is, if I understand you correctly, is actively not interested in your research. Now, <laughs> the Japanese government tries to decontaminate those uh, irradiated areas. And it tries to, because it tries to kind of uh, recreate uh, something like a normality, or that I believe, what they believe is a normality. Do you believe that by this, uh, with these uh, decontamination efforts, they actually make the thing, your, your problem worse by redistributing and repumping radiation into the environment? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good question. Uh, you know, uh, the short answer is we don't know uh, what the consequences of this uh, shifting of contaminated dirt will be in the long run. Uh, I should have brought some photos. We were, you know, we spent a lot of time last month in these areas, and the the amount of dirt that's being piled up into these mountains is just overwhelming. Uh, every and because there is no uh, concerted policy related to to the whole decontamination decontamination problem, uh, there are these piles in in every municipality. Uh, I don't know how many there are now, but there there are a lot. Uh, and certainly these piles of dirt are not going to last forever. They're in plastic bags. And so there is this longer term issue that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, uh, I, you know, again, the broader question though is really, will this decontamination effort do more than uh, reduce the external dose rates in areas where people are expected to, to, to come back to? And, and, and that seems to be um, uh, a debatable question, perhaps, but it, 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 it seems very unlikely that it's, it's going to result in anything other than uh, a very localized uh, reduction in the external dose rate uh, in these highly localized areas where the date dirt is being scraped off the ground. And so the rest of Fukushima, uh, which is a very large area, of course, will be unaffected. And of course, this kind of cleanup effort is not being attempted in the areas of higher contamination. That, that Again, that, that has been proven to be ineffective. So it's really focused in areas that uh, where there's some chance that, that people might return. Um, and it's very, very expensive. Um, again, it, it's probably... It, it seems unlikely that there will be a long-term broader ecological consequence of the moving of the dirt from these highly localized areas simply because it is, it's a relatively small area that's, that's being scraped off. Uh, and so uh, it seems unlikely that there will be long-term consequences for the broader ecosystem uh, because of that localization. Uh, John Boyd, freelance writer. Um, I wonder, are there any scientific uh, links that you can make from animals and plants being affected by radiation to uh, human health? Uh, can you generalize, perhaps, and maybe even be specific in Chernobyl and uh, Fukushima? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, well, let me, let me just start by uh, asking you all... Uh, well, I don't have to ask you. Most medical research in the world is conducted on animal model systems of one sort, including plants <laughs> and birds, fish, uh, cell lines. Uh, and, and the reason is, of course, that these model systems have attractive features that make them usable, workable in a, in a laboratory setting or, or in some other way, but they also share fundamental biological properties with, with humans. We are, after all, just an animal. Uh, we are, uh, I think I watched a recent movie, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, we share 99% of our DNA sequence with uh, chimps. The, uh, of course, the, we share 100% of our fundamental biochemical machinery with other primates and other mammals. You know, we, we all work the same way. 
And so, so of course, what we see in plants and animals has relevance for humans. Now, what the, the major difference is that in the human populations in Fukushima, uh, luckily, are not uh, facing the same level of exposures that the animal systems that we're working with are seeing. Uh, you know, we are deliberately working in areas of the highest contamination in cleaner areas so that we have the maximum range of radiation to work with so that our research uh, is uh, as, as, as sensitive as it can possibly be with the least amount of time <laughs> and the least amount of money. Uh, uh, because to work at the levels that, that the humans are experiencing uh, would require much, much larger sample sizes and much larger uh, study designs, and we we're just not able to do that. But it would certainly be worth pursuing. Um, the, uh, but yes, you know, fundamentally, anything we see with these animals has relevance for, for the humans in the area. It's just that the humans will have a much lower dose rate, and so they're likely to be affected uh, to, to require much longer for any kind of consequences to, to show up. Uh, regarding the uh, question that was just asked, uh, uh, my name is Fujita, I'm with Kokumi Shimp. Um, all the uh, theory, of, theory of radiation originates to uh, fruit fry experiment. <laughs> and I heard that um, uh, fruit fry doesn't have a capability to, to uh, re sort of uh, restore DNA damage immunity. Mm. I, I, I don't think that's correct. I, I, I think there, there, there are certain chromosomes mm -hmm. on the fruit fly. Mm -hmm. or is that the question? My question is that, that also the experience was you know, uh, done by high dose radiation, not low dose. Ah. So the concept of arara, as low as reasonably achievable, achievable was uh, developed. So th the lower the radiation, the better is the idea. But recently, there are a lot of uh, scientists like contact uh, who says that's wrong. For example, Wade Allison, the um, professor at Oxford University, uh, the author of the uh, Reason and uh, Radiation, he says that uh, low dose radiation is not just uh, harmful for uh, human body but uh, or health, but even better for health because of the you know DNA's recovery system. Well, what's your comment along this line? Well, thank you very much. Um, let's start with fruit flies. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny. I I, uh, I actually uh, spent some time in Chernobyl looking for fruit flies because I, I, I my training is actually in genetics and entomology, and so I figured as a as a an entomologist. You know, and a geneticist, I, I should be doing work on fruit flies. And, uh, and you can bring them into the lab and do all these things. And we got to Chernobyl. I went to Chernobyl one, one fall looking for them, and, and I couldn't find any fruit flies. And I was kind of baffled because there are fruit trees all over Chernobyl. And there's, so there should have been lots of, and, and they weren't being picked, of course. The fruit was, should have been just falling to the ground and rotting. But then I looked at the fruit trees. There were no fruit. There were very little fruit on the ground. And then I looked around and realized, there weren't any bees. There weren't any butterflies, or very few. Uh, and that's really what instigated the start of many of these census studies. Uh, and so, so it took us a while to get going with the fruit flies. But we have been doing some work on fruit flies. And as far as I know, uh, they do have repair on certain of their chromosomes. But the, but the sex chromosome, uh, where there's only one copy, uh, is, uh, has less repair. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure there's some repair capability. Uh, the, um, the more important question concerns uh, whether or not there's any evidence of, one, a threshold below which there are no negative effects of, of radiation, and two, uh, and you bring up a word that I don't like to use because there's really very little evidence for it, uh, this, but, this, but since I've used it recently, I, I will mention it, hormesis this notion that a little bit of radiation uh, is actually potentially good for you because it turns on DNA repair. And you, you, you know, there are a few folks out there who will bring this up and suggest that, that this is what's happening. The truth is there, there, there are no good scientific, experimental scientific data uh, to demonstrate that this is indeed the case. From an evolutionary point of view, from a fundamental genetics point of view, it makes no sense. And the reason is that uh, there have been billions of years 
of evolution on this planet, our genetic systems have been refined and optimized over these billions of years. And the truth is, most mutations that occur in all organisms either have no effect because of the redundancy in the basic genetic code, or they have a slightly deleterious effect. Any mutation of large effect is usually deleterious and kills the carrier, and, and so they disappear very quickly. And so all, most of the machinery in our cells, in fact, <coughs> is associated with repairing the damage that occurs every day, all the time, just by being alive. Our basic fundamental metabolic processes generate oxidative stress. This oxidative stress is a, is a primary cause of genetic damage, and, and so much of our biochemical machinery is there in place to repair the damage caused by day-to-day -day living. Radiation simply adds to that. Uh, in fact, ionizing radiation, one of the effects of ionizing radiation is to increase oxidative stress. And much of our recent studies, I didn't go into the details here, but many of our recent studies are related to the fact that this oxidative stress actually is probably one of the underlying causes, universal underlying causes, to the deleterious effects that we're seeing in many of these organisms. The radiation raises oxidative stress, the organisms can't cope with it, there's genetic mutations that result, and phenotypic consequences or fitness consequences, survival and reproduction consequences of this genetic damage. So, so the notion that a little bit of radiation is helpful is, is, is silly because actually this little bit of extra radiation is simply adding to the same kinds of mutagens that are already in our bodies that we're doing our very best every day to repair and is ultimately the cause of aging and death in most organisms anyway. So, so again, hormesis is, 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 is a very unlikely hypothesis for which there's no support. <laughs> a quick follow-up question. Well, maybe a silly question, <laughs> but uh, if so, uh, the result that you just showed us, isn't there a possibility that it, 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 not because of the radiation, because of the stress? Of the, for example, you know, evacuation or earthquake or the whatever. Uh, uh, thank you for for, for raising that uh, that that issue, and 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 that is precisely why we're working with barn swallows and butterflies and grasshoppers, and and mice. Uh, as far as I know, they you know they, they don't smoke, they don't drink vodka, and and I don't think they get stressed, uh, psychologically stressed. Now, of course, they do experience all sorts of other kinds of stress, like avoiding being eaten by other animals or finding food to eat. Uh, and so, so yes, I, I agree that life in the wild in nature is probably much more stressful from that kind of perspective uh, than life in the laboratory, uh, where many of these past studies have been conducted, uh, for instance. And, and, and this is one of the reasons why, for instance, the work that we've been doing in Chernobyl and other people in Chernobyl uh, recently analyzed by, by some of the, uh, the industry, nuclear industry folks, uh, it shows that the animals and plants there seem to be about eight times on average, eight times more sensitive to radioactive contaminants than they are in the laboratory setting. Again, that's just a rule of thumb from one little survey, uh, but certainly our, our results indicate that, that there's a higher level of sensitivity or susceptibility to these contaminants than, than one might have predicted based on laboratory studies. But there's no evidence of a threshold. There's no evidence of, of anything but something approaching a, a linear no, no, no threshold dose response. Uh, Murata, for, <coughs> former Japanese ambassador to Switzerland. You're making efforts against the efforts of uh, minimization of the dangers of radiation. In this connection, don't you think the member states of IAEA should try to reform the IAEA endowed with contradictory uh, uh, mission to prevent proliferation and spread uh, Pacific use of nuclear energy. In this connection, I would like to inform you that there is a joint statement signed by former Japanese Prime Minister Hosokawa and former President of Swiss Confederation, Maurice Leuenberg, uh, in which uh, this statement uh, proposes the uh, reform of uh, the IAEA and the strengthening of control of the existing 
uh, nuclear reactors. And uh, <laughs> that is, I have prepared <coughs> this statement so you can see it to my website. And uh, I think it is a shame for member states not uh, fully aware that this international organization represents the interests of electric companies. Thank you very much. Um, uh, since I'm, I, 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 I'm just thankful that there are uh, others out there who are interested in the broader questions related to policy and intergovernmental um, um, issues. It's not an area of, of my, it's not a specialty of mine at this point, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm, I'm certainly thankful for any attempts to raise awareness of the broader issues. And, and again, it's not, uh, again, I, I, I can't make any claims uh, concerning uh, uh, you know, larger attempts to minimize danger. Uh, I, I'm simply raising the issue that, that the scientific evidence is not being uh, clearly presented, properly presented in, a, in an objective and rigorous manner. That's, that's really my only mission. Jessica Kozuka, freelance. I have a question that might be a little bit out of your wheelhouse, <laughs> um, but uh, mostly what you've shown us today has to do with the uh, insects and birds and kind of smaller animals. And I've read in regard to Chernobyl and I think Fukushima as well that there's been kind of explosion of larger animals because normally they would be pushed out by human habitat encroachment. Um, I'm wondering what you've witnessed in those populations in terms of uh, changes due to radiation, and to what extent you feel like things like uh, the population drops that you talked about might also be related to explosions in predator populations? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really didn't have time to, to, to present that aspect of, of, of our findings. We, we've actually published a few papers uh, related to that topic, uh, including uh, a paper on the birds of prey in Chernobyl, the raptors, again showing uh, significant declines in the areas of high contamination, uh, although we do see some increases in the areas outside of the exclusion zone for the raptors in the clean areas. Uh, we've also uh, uh, done, uh, written a paper, published a paper uh, two years ago, one year ago. <laughs> I'm losing track. Uh, my brain is getting smaller. But the, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, showing, showing, again, uh, we, we went to Chernobyl. We couldn't figure out how the quick, easiest way to look at mammals. Mammals are so much harder to work with, especially the large ones. They're often nocturnal, and they're smart, and they avoid people. And so uh, we went in the wintertime. Uh, and tracked them in the snow. We waited for fresh snowfall and counted the tracks. There's not so many that you can't actually identify them from the, from the footprints. And we repeated the basic same procedure that we've used with the birds, with the mammals in the winter, and found the same basic pattern for all of the mammals we looked at, except for the wolves. Uh, the wolves actually it, it didn't show any pattern of uh, variation with, uh, with the radiation. We presume this is simply because they have much larger territories that encompass uh, hot and cold areas, but again, this needs to be uh, fully tested. But in terms of uh, the numbers of deer, uh, there's no evidence that they've exploded. Again, any of you uh, who live in semi-wild areas know that if there's the hunting stops on deer, the populations explode. Uh, you know, you can't avoid them. Uh, we don't see any evidence of that. There are a few more wild boar, uh, obvious, that, that, that you wouldn't see outside of the zone, but they tend to be found in the cleaner parts of the zone. And I think I mentioned this earlier, and there was a map on the first slide. The Chernobyl zone is very heterogeneous. There, there are vast areas that are very clean and areas that are very hot. The animals, the larger mammals in particular, and the birds, are more likely to be seen in these areas, these clean areas within the zone, than, than in the contaminated areas. So to suggest that populations are exploding uh, is really kind of a, it's a bit of a red herring in, in terms of the, the, the broader issue of whether or not the radioactivity is having any direct effects on these populations. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Okay, unfortunately I think that's uh, all that we have time for today, is that correct? Do we have time for one more question? I'm not getting any uh, response. Uh, if everybody's cool, then we'll have one, one more question, perhaps. Okay. And, and I, 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 I will be around for a little bit later if anybody's interested in having you Thanks. Here. Um, yeah, this is uh, another way of asking the question about the relationship be between your findings and conclusions that you might draw for humans. Hmm. Um, from, from what I've, I, I've read about a number of, of studies 
um, including foreign ones, um, which have, have looked at the possible long-term effect on human health of the Fukushima disaster. And unless I've missed something, the, the, the general tentative conclusion seems to be that, that there isn't a reason to expect any big spike, for example, in, in cancers. And if there is a long-term effect, it's likely to be so uh, small in percentage terms that you won't really be able to identify people in the general population who have got sick because of Fukushima or might have got sick anyway. Um, I, I'm, trying to rem I'm struggling to remember now the details, but I think there was one from a Californian university that, that you know, figures of, uh, of a few dozen or maybe 200 over uh, a lifetime have been uh, cited, which for a, a population that large isn't very significant. Based on what you've, you've seen in, in the effect on, on wildlife, animals, etc., do you think that's credible? You know, so the, the short answer is um, I don't think we really know uh, with any level of certainty uh, the likely, uh, the, the outcome, the potential outcome of the levels of exposure uh, received by uh, people living in Japan at the time uh, and currently living in these areas of significant contamination in some areas. Uh, I, the reason I say that is because uh, much of what we know about cancer epidemiology stems from uh, the uh, studies of atomic bomb survivors, which have uh, some significant flaws and differences uh, with respect to the kinds of exposures uh, we're seeing as a result of, of nuclear accidents. Uh, the uh, atomic bomb survivors uh, were dealing primarily with a single acute exposure, uh, and uh, the uh, survivors of the Fukushima and Chernobyl disasters are dealing with chronic low-dose exposure in addition to the initial uh, higher doses uh, that were received. Most of the epidemiology is based on dose estimates that are based on where were you at this time, uh, so personal recollection of, of events rather than direct measurements of exposures or doses. So there's a lot of uncertainty in, 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 in that aspect of these studies. Um, the lifespan studies didn't start until five years after uh, the war ended. Uh, so there are many uh, shortcomings to those studies in terms of application uh, to this kind of event. The studies in Chernobyl, uh, again, deeply flawed in many regards uh, with respect to the epidemiology. And certainly uh, there are many questions being raised, especially now with respect to uh, the other kinds of morbidities that appear to be associated with this kind of exposure. So all I'm saying is that there are many uncertainties in, in terms of how these models are applied uh, and about how human populations respond to this kind of exposure, which is uh, quite different from, from atomic bomb survivors. Um, and I think that that really is the main point. There are a growing number of uh, studies uh, of Chernobyl uh, victims that are certainly pointing to, again, a, a variety of, of, of outcomes, morbidities that uh, really suggest more research uh, is needed. That's probably all I should say. Okay, well, I would like to ask you all to please join me and uh, in a warm thank you for Professor Mousseau and his presentation today. Thank you very much. Uh, as is customary, uh, the FCCJ is, uh, would like to offer you a one-year honorary membership to the club. Wow. <laughs> and so uh, we know that you go back and forth uh, between different countries, including Australia and other places in Japan. And we look forward to uh, having you here at the club again. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ian. Great. I'll, I'll use this. Thank you very much. <laughs>